Um, so our last speaker for the afternoon session is uh, Michael Lee uh, from Oxford. He's going to talk about the boring monopoly. Please. Hi, uh, hello everyone, um, and thanks to the organisers for the, the chance to speak. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, trying to answer the question and quantify um, whether magnetic monopoles uh, can catalyze phase transitions and essentially seed them so that they happen more quickly. That's the basic idea, and it's uh, mostly based on this work, but um, we'll at the end of the time to talk on some uh, future directions. But, so we apply the same ideas to uh, other scenarios. Um, so the uh, basic motivation, okay. Um, so the basic sort of uh, inspiration or motivation for this is that uh, phase transitions that we see every day are often seeded or happen more quickly because of the presence of impurities. And so uh, one sort of nice example from particle physics is that of a bubble chamber. So with some of these bubble chamber experiments work is that you have a liquid which is in a super cool uh, phase. Um, so the preferred phase is the gas. And then when you have a particle come in to the detector, um, the particle deposits energy along its path and uh, that, that energy which is deposited actually seeds the phase transitions. And so you get pictures like this where the bubbles form along the, the track of the particle. So that, that's just one example, um, but there are many others. Um, but usually um, in cosmology, we assume that we start from a homogeneous uh, pulse vacuum state. Um, so we don't consider that there's any uh, presence of impurities. So the picture looks something like this, where on this, this leftmost plot, we start in some uh, false vacuum state described by some uh, order parameter or the better of the scalar field. And then at some rate, gamma, uh, where, okay, so uh, we start nucleating these bubbles of true vacuum, and then they expand. And um, if this rate of uh, which the bubbles are nucleated is larger than the Hubble, then we end up in the, uh, the whole universe is in the true vacuum state. Um, and so I should just point out the notation. So this FB subscript I'm going to use throughout the talk that is uh, talking about tunneling from a homogeneous false vacuum state, um, just to distinguish it from the uh, monopole uh, induced tunneling which we'll talk about later. Um, and so uh, given that the, uh, we know that the CC today is zero, um, we have a sort of minimal Hubble rate which is given from the CC from the false vacuum. Um, so this can also bounce on models uh, uh, by requiring that the phase transition to this. Um, but for uh, the picture changes somewhat if we have some presence of impurities. So uh, these red dots here are our impurities and um, there's some new rate uh, at which these impurities sort of turn into bubbles of the true vacuum. And so the picture we have in mind, and then we have some different rate for which the same requirement here for the phase transition to complete. Um, and so this new rate depends on the number density of impurities, and then there's going to be some different tunneling experiment. Um, this experiment describes going from the, the impurity to some bubble of true uh, And basically, the point is that uh, because of this exponential dependence on these exponents, if the bounce action for this impurity driven phase that transition is smaller than the false vacuum case, even by sort of order one and now, actually, this rate can be much, much faster from. Um, for the tunneling in the presence of these impurities. Okay, so um, just to quickly recap, um, the this exponent in the false vacuum case is uh, given by the Euclidean action of uh, the false vacuum bounce, the bounce solution, which interpolates between uh, um, for some scalar field, interpolates between some region close to the true vacuum to the asymptot and asymptotically reaches the false vacuum state. And so there's sort of some uh, region with a characteristic size R um, of true vacuum inside the bubble and then outside you back into the pulse vacuum. And uh, for the zero temperature case, which is what we're considering here, this depends on this sort of O4 symmetric uh, combination of coordinates. So uh, R squared and tau is the, the Euclidean time. Um, and in the sort of thick wall picture where you can uh, just parameterize everything in terms of the radius, the potential uh, the energy sort of looks like this as a function of the radius of the bubble. Um, and this is sort of you, the false vacuum solution is that the bubble with zero size. And then there's sort of some critical size uh, here. Um, so the, in terms of just R, you sort of tunnel it again to here. Um, but this is just a quick recap to compare to the monopole case later. Um, so uh, the, in some sense, monopoles are, perhaps the most natural candidate for 
um, some type of impurity um, that could seed phase transitions, at least in this, some setups. So uh, we consider two polypop monopoles. So we have an SU2 gauge group, which, uh, sorry, a gauge group which is broken to U1 by fire here, which is a triplet of SU2. And so the monopole solution, um, we have A here is the SU2 index, and this R hat is a spatial orientation. So at least in this gauge, uh, every uh, different sort of uh, orientation around the monopole is mapped to a different direction in field space. And the uh, only way for this map to be continuous is if phase, uh, sorry, the uh, scalar field vanishes at the origin. So we have some monoprofile, monopole profile, which looks like this. And if uh, the, the um, true vacuum of the scalar potential is put in at zero or uh, close to zero, then this sort of looks like a bubble of true vacuum. Um, where the radius in this case is set by one on G times V. So like one on the W mass, where G is the gauge point. Um, and then there's also the gauge field, which uh, for the purposes of the tunnel doesn't sort of add too much, but uh, that's the profile. And again, topology requires that this vanishes as you go to zero. So if we have some setup where uh, the sort of the symmetry of stored phase is the true vacuum, then uh, you'd expect some of these monopoles to catalyze the phase transition. They kind of look like small bubbles. And so the picture looks something like this. So this is the same picture as before, so the false vacuum case. Um, but now for the monopole case, um, we have the potential looks something like this, where we have some minimum here, which is the monopole. And so we're sort of starting with a small bubble and tunneling to a large bubble, as opposed to starting from a modulus false vacuum or a bubble of zero size. So it's perhaps natural to just expect that this, this uh, tunneling for this would be uh, smaller. Uh, so it would be less suppressed than the false vacuum. And uh, this idea is not new. This has uh, been pointed out a long time ago. Uh, and there's also some more recent work on, on this effect. Um, but in so the very early papers were considering the limit of a classical instability. So that's when uh, basically this barrier disappears and the monopole radius is of order the sort of radius of critical bubble size. Um, and this more recent work uh, has been focusing on the thin wall limit, where it really does look like this. Um, but that's not generally applicable. So the sort of uh, our, our work is to sort of extend this to a more general case. Um, and the reason why that's difficult is because um, so in the false vacuum case, we had this O4 symmetry where the um, bounce action depends on this parameter rho. Um, whereas in the monopole case, we no longer have this. Um, so one way to see this is that um, the, for the monopole time when we start with some monopole profile, which is a function of R, and at, uh, asymptotically Euclidean time, and then at uh, Euclidean time equal to zero, this has to move to a, uh, a bubble of critical size. And so this boundary condition at large Euclidean time uh, is R dependent, doesn't depend on rho, so it uh, breaks the symmetry. Um, so that's just one way to see it. The equations of motion also explicitly have factors of R. Um, so you can no longer make this simplifying assumption, you need to solve the full PDE. Uh, as a function of R and tau. And so in order to do this, we have to come up with sort of a new method. Um, and the sort of uh, uh, basic idea of this method is to sort of start with a guess. Um, so if we, uh, what we're looking for is a saddle point of the action. So this picture here is supposed to be like a, a schematic. The vertical height of these contours is the action. And the different point here is a different field configuration. And we're looking for a saddle point. So we want to start with some gas and then minimize the action and sort of move towards the saddle point. Um, the problem is, as this is a saddle, uh, there are runaway directions which are impossible to avoid. So a usual minimization procedure, um, you're just going to find some, um, you're not going to hit this saddle point basically unless you're very lucky. Um, and so basically we want to try and turn this sort of search for a saddle point into a minimization problem, which we can solve numerically. And uh, what we use for that is what's called the mountain pass theorem. And it basically states that if uh, you have some functional i, in our case, we're thinking of this as the action, and we have a local minimum, uh, F0, and another, some other point in this functional space, F1, which the action, where the action is below F0. So the picture is kind of uh, uh, something like this, where we have F0 as a minimum, um, a, or a local minimum, I should say. And so, and then there's some point F1, which has a lower action. And so to get from F0 to F1, you have to sort of climb up over this hill and then turn around and go down to a 
value. And uh, so the theorem states that if you take all continuous paths from F naught to F1, so that's sort of these paths along these curves here, and then you take the maximum point along the path. So here alpha is just parameterizing this path. So you start at F naught, you climb up to ridge here, and uh, you take this maximum point. Then the path which sort of crosses this ridge at the lowest point crosses at the side. Um, so yeah, again, so these four blue paths are, are paths connecting the two and these blue dots at the maximum point along the path. Um, but the red one crosses at the lowest point and this lowest point is, is guaranteed to be safe. So that's what this theorem is buying us. And the, the reason why it's helpful is because this is now sort of a minimization problem. We, instead of considering a single field point, uh, field configuration, we consider a path and maximize along the path. We can then use a minimization procedure to find the setup. Okay, um, so yeah, as I said, this the, the action um, which uh, is satisfies these conditions. So we have a minimum already, which is the monopole solution. And it's relatively easy to find this some sort of supercritical bubble, which has just which is sort of a very large bubble with a large region of true vacuum, and um, that will have a negative pi. So that's our point over here. And then this other point that we're looking for is this bounce action which describes this sort of expansion of the model. Um, so we start with some, we find the monopole solution and then we make some runs and find a, a supercritical solution where I is negative. And then we have some, pick some interpolation, um, sort of some initial guess of path. Yeah. And then basically what we want to do is sort of iterate and move this path closer to this red one, which goes over the subtle. And so the way we do that, yeah, as I said, we pick some interpolation. Alpha again is a parameter along the path. And so each point on this sort of map here is a, a field profile H, which is the scalar field as a function of R and tau, and also U, the gauge field. And uh, we find alpha bar, which is sort of the point along this uh, interpolation where the action is maximized. So that would be one of these blue dots. And then um, we just use, uh, this is just a, a gradient descent sort of uh, algorithm. So N here, um, so N is the, the sort of step, the iteration, and N plus one is the new step. Uh, the, the new pro updated profile, uh, beta is just some step size, step size, there are different ways you can um, implement the algorithm. And then what we really do, what we're doing is subtracting the uh, equation. So this will minimize the action. And um, the sort of key point is that instead of just doing it for the one profile, we sort of update the entire path in a, a way that preserves the endpoints. Um, so instead of just shifting one point to a near point, we're sort of shifting this whole path to the next point. And uh, in that way, we can eventually find the saddle point. And so this is just um, a plot showing that as a function of the number of iterations of uh, this sort of stepping on the paths, our I bar, so that's the action maximized along the path changes. So as you would expect, this is just, you're minimizing this explicitly. So um, it will decrease as it does and eventually saturates. But also see here, um, it's kind of complicated formula, but basically this is a calculating the equation of motion at every point on the grid, uh, squaring it and then taking the square root, normalizing it in some way. So this is kind of a measure of how well the equation of motion is satisfied. And so obviously you'd expect it to be satisfied at this other point. Um, and so as you can see, it also decreases um, with, uh, as the number of iterations uh, increases. So this is sort of also a good cross check because um, it's not just sort of finding some random direction um, where we have a small action. Um, and these sort of jumps in, in here uh, in, in this are due to the fact that um, the sort of point along the path which maximizes the action. Uh, but um, okay, so uh, just this, so that's the procedure, and then I'm going to show some results for this for a sort of simplified model. Um, so we have this is the potential for the scalar field. Um, so we need to have a situation where the uh, Broken phase is the false vacuum, and then at the origin, the unbroken phase is the true vacuum, and some barrier in between. So for that, we need a dimension six potential, and we have sort of two parameterizing in this way. So there's uh, this parameter epsilon, uh, which uh, basically gives the diff 
difference in height between the two vacua and lambda is sort of an overall scaling of the potential. And there's also the gauge coupling, which doesn't appear here, of course, but uh, that's at the, the monopole radius. Um, so in this kind of control model, these are the results. So the red line in both pictures is the usual uh, false vacuum bound. So the tunnel from the is false vacuum, and that's compared to the monopole catalyte bounce here. So in this one, it's a function of epsilon keeping lambda. So lambda is the scaling of the potential fixed and the gauge coupling of water one. And um, so as, as the difference in the height the two vacua uh, increases, they both go to zero, but you can see that the monopole bounce is a factor of 100 or so um, smaller than the homogeneous tunneling rate. Uh, and then this, this, this right part is keeping lambda and epsilon fixed. So the parameters of the scalar potential are fixed, but varying the gauge coupling. So as you go to smaller gauge coupling, the monopole radius is larger. And um, so uh, you, the monopole is sort of closer to a critical size. And then for these parameters, at least that G equals 0.7, uh, the monopole is already cool just spontaneously. It's classically unstable and spontaneously expand. Um, and so the, the point of this is just to sort of quantify how large this effect can be. And because it appears in this exponent, you, you get that this ratio of the sort of exponential suppressions for each of the points in this plot fall somewhere in this range. So it's uh, uh, the smallest, the worst case scenario in some sense is 66 orders of magnitude. Although the actual rate will still be suppressed further by the number density, um, it's it's kind of clear from these results, at least in this setup, that the, the monopole catalyzed tunneling rate can uh, exponentially dominate the, the tunneling from the homogeneous false rate. Um, so, as I said, there was kind of like a bit of a toy setup, um, but there's uh, are, are known scenarios where it's uh, sort of more um, sort of phenomenologically viable, I guess. And so, um, this is a paper that came out recently where they consider a standard model plus a single scalar, where the scalar is odd on the Z2 symmetry. And for a, a, a generic choice of parameters, uh, so you get this kind of uh, phase structure where high temperatures, both uh, the scalars are zero dev, and then um, there's symmetry breaking in the S direction, and this phase transition will form domain walls. And if there's a portal coupling, which uh, H squared, S squared, then um, these domain walls can trigger the phase to transition to the standard model back. And so this is their results in their paper. So the orange curve is the homogeneous tunneling rate. And these three uh, curves, uh, so I should say they did this in a sort of analytical approximation. And so going from the green to the orange to the blue curves, they're including sort of more, um, a more modes in their expansion. And uh, they're also using a T-squared approximation potential. But uh, as you can see, there's sort of a vast difference in the, in the bounce action between the two in this, in this approximation. Um, so uh, sort of future work which we're looking at at the moment is uh, sort of extending this volume beyond the T-squared approximation using the, the same algorithm that I showed before to calculate the domain wall induced uh, tunnel um, sort of more generality as they also have this sort of band here where it's, uh, it's, it's not covered. And so this has potentially a significant um, implications for the, uh, the gravitational wave signal for, for given parameters as well. Because uh, for example, um, the, uh, the gravitational wave signal depends on the derivative of the action as it goes through the, the point of the phase transition. So um, if you're, uh, so, so this, this top vertical line is the condition for the homogeneous um, if you false vacuum uh, transition to complete. So you sort of cross it at this point and then you have sort of a moderate slope as a function of temperature. Whereas in the seated case, the condition is this lower line and you expect to be in this regime much closer to the critical temperature. And so the, the slope is much, much faster. So the uh, actual parameters which give you the gravitational wave signal to be um, significantly changed because you're kind of much closer to the critical time. Um, so that's one future direction and another sort of like uh, less fully formed idea, but um, could still be interesting is that uh, uh, we know that the uh, Higgs, at least given sort of experimental bounds on the current parameters and standard model, has a new minimum at a high, high temperature. And so if we live in a gut theory with some monopole, 
uh, which um, could lead to some monopoles. Um, so fires, the gut breaking scale off, and patients, the heat. And if we sort of live in this vacuum where the gut symmetry is broken and the heat is at the urge weak value, and we have some new minimum here where phi is, all, phi, uh, is zero or close to, then a monopole solution will interpolate between this point in this parameter space to the, the sort of asymptotic value, which is the value we see. And if the potential barrier is something here, then this core of the monopole, while not being at the true vacuum, is still is closer to the true vacuum um, than the back the, where we sit uh, today, if that makes sense. So uh, you've already paid sort of some of the price of the tunneling, and potentially this this rate could be enhanced. Um, so um, one one possibility is that this could potentially put a bound on the number density of the monopoles by not triggering the decay of the OG vacuum. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'll end there, but the uh, basically take home message is that um, topological defects can catalyze phase transitions and that the uh, rates can be exponentially enhanced even for a very small number of these things. So I'm trying to understand a bit. What happens to the monopole once the uh, tunneling happens? So uh, I basically the, the monopole expands to I think the, the topology of the monopole is the same, but it's a, just a much larger profile. Um, and then once it reaches a certain size, it has a ball which is in a true vacuum, which is large enough that it will spontaneously expand exactly like the, the usual. Basically, it does the become larger, larger, and it just hit up the rest of the uh, ball stacking? Yes, it, like the same way as like a usual sort of So we are inside one. Right, that, that was my picture, but then I was struggling because then what happened to the topological stability of the model? Because we cannot destroy the model. That's what probably you said the topology stays the same, but yes. it's just expanding and just eating up the ball stack by doing that. Yeah, so you would not expect to just have like one monopole, you'd have sort of equal number of monopole and anti monopole pairs, and then uh, they'll sort of meet, and that will sort of unwind the topology if you, if you have a large sort of network. Okay, but, so. then, but then one, one thing that still confuses me though is that. The bound section computation is the configuration that connects the truth the false vacuum, which uh, encodes the nucleation of the truth of the true vacuum in the bath of the false vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. But then you might be seeing the monopole as if it is already nucleated through vacuum, but then in this case, you, you will hope that this guy can uh, expand enough so that the volume energy overwhelms the surface energy that it actually becomes the true vacuum. So mm -hmm. then Conceptually, then the, the bound section computation you demonstrate is it actually corresponding to the tunneling process of probability or is it the expansion part? Because the expansion part is already kind of fixed once you know the web volume energy versus surface tension energy. So, uh, I, I think you're asking so the expansion by the expansion part, you mean like once you have a bubble, uh, mon monopole or a bubble which is above the critical size, it would just if it is bigger than that, you expect yeah. otherwise it's collapsed. The yeah, so for the parameters we're considering, uh, the monopole is that you, you kind of have this this picture. So the monopole is, is stable if you just leave it there, it's 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 not going to expand, okay, but um. So the usual in the false vacuum picture, you start with the sort of asymptote to the false vacuum, and then as a function of your cleaning time, you sort of grow a bubble and then it goes back. So this monopole solution is kind of the same, except the asymptotic solution you're matching up to is the monopole profile. So in as a function of your cleaning time, it looks like a monopole going from sort of this radius here and then increasing to this radius here and then going back. Does that, that make sense? Like that's the sort of bound solution that you have to do. Right, the bound solution is going back, but time evolution of the bound solution can be interpreted in the Copsi picture as a nucleation, right? As so in the Euclidean yeah. picture, what you said is correct, kinematic picture. Uh -huh. But if you transfer back to the Copsi space picture, then you, now all of a sudden you have a picture of nucleating a new bubble, and then all will expand, provided right. the volume energy will remain still. Yes. Yeah. I guess we can have more of a plan. Okay. Uh, I think, well, Katie has a question. Yeah. Well, I try to understand. Uh, Sorry, could you speak louder just so that. Uh, okay. I try to understand whether the presence of monopoles will affect the bubble warming. 
now you have a bubble formed by the monocles and also ambient monocles around it. So the mm -hmm. monocles in the bubble wall is bubble formed by monocles. What happens? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, the the sort of dynamics of these bubbles as they collide and um, what happens after the actual phase transition is not something. is an interesting question, but it's not something. That's so actually, why would you do. have a situation where a monopole is not nucleating and growing, but the other one is not? How do you get that? It's, it's, it's probably yeah. yeah. So there are two questions. Of course, that maybe two big bubbles can collide. Like, like, think about, I don't know, we have first sort of electrolytic phase transition. We have an ambient plasma. Yeah, this is a plasma, but that one is one. So, I think let's go to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for the next slide. So, I'm wondering what happens if you. We have some of those to work with. So let's say things did not come to the typical temperature, mm -hmm. even, even maybe the monopole can go away and cause some separation. After that, you guys just imagine that as things were undergoing some media inflation, all these monopoles are just kind of get diluted and get back to the usual story of um, uh, like thick wall, false vacuum kind of thing. Yeah, so. I guess if you have a low enough, if the number density is less than, I guess, at least half one per Hubble, then, um, yeah, then I guess this sort of assumes a smooth number density to sort of be able to apply this in some way. Otherwise, if you have sort of like one per Hubble or less, then um, it's just a probabilistic process of, of, of one um, discrete event. So this sort of picture doesn't, doesn't make as much sense. Um, and if you have a low enough number density, then the false vacuum decay will dominate it. Okay. Um, so any other questions? Yeah. 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 Any other questions? So I, I had uh, a quick question. I think towards the end, you were showing results of uh, comparing your results with some other people. And I think there was an O2 solution that you were referring to. Um, um, so I, I am aware of O3 and O4 bounce actions that you could write this. You know what? This oh, so this 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 actually is basically that the, you have a dense domain wall and then the transverse direction is the z direction, and they the the way they do did this calculation is to sort of expand put uh, cut off in the z direction, expand in eigenmodes, and then do the calculation in the three D here. I see. So they went to the transverse directions and then yeah, and they just sort of integrated out modes along. Direction. So the the O three would be kind of the equivalent. Oh, right, right. And, right. You just oh, and O2 is the O3. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, one other question was so when you motivated in the beginning that monopoles are natural to exist, and you know, coming from the picture that there are defects which can seed transition. Mm -hmm. So I would say even, even more natural defects are black holes, right? Which yes. And I know there are some people who have thought about it, but have, have you guys thought about how to set it up? It might be probably more complicated because the core is the horizon, so the boundary conditions is. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's not this. So there's been a well, we might be inside a cosmological uh, <laughs> <laughs> singularity yeah. like that. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so there have been a few papers recently on, on exactly yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And as far as I know, it's not exactly perfectly well understood uh, how to actually calculate yeah. yes. that. And it's also sort of qualitatively different from topological physics because this is just all within field theory. Um, right. you, you've not included the way not including the effects of gravity. You could, you could try to do that. But, um, so that's a gravitational effect as opposed to just a field theoretic one. And um, yeah, I'm not sure how that calculation works. But I, I don't think it's like um, you could sort of do this kind of procedure. Yeah, there's another. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm just wondering if there's any way that the monopole state work in the first place? Because you are saying that inside the monopole, you have two vacuum outside in the false vacuum. Usually, it is like other way around because we have the vacuum pressure which is collapsing the monopole and the magnetic field is kind of pushing it up. So, what is making the energy of the monopole energy for the state first? Um, so, you have sort of two competing. Well, so I guess, like, even in the cross second case, you could just imagine a small bubble 
and then it's not stable, it will collapse, right? So if the bubble is not of a critical size, it's not going to want to expand. Um, but the monopole is prevented from collapsing because of this topology. Or you can also consider it that it has a magnetic charge. If you collapse, it's a zero so that magnetic charge just is. So it can't collapse to a smaller bubble. So you're basically allowed to have subcritical bubbles, or in this case, you want. Question, but I have a <laughs> so, so then looks like so. Suppose I have a theory where the usual uh, phase transition is second order, okay? okay? But then I was wondering if monopole can catalyze one actually turn that into a first order phase transition. This, this looks like this must be a first order phase transition if it is real, right? Uh, not necessarily, like this. I mean, obviously, there's a shell of some other energy density stuff, and then through that, instead of that, it should take kick out of that thing. So it looks like it must go through the tunneling process. So to me, more of catalyze the tunneling or vacuum transition looks like first order, no matter what. On the other hand, other kind, like cross vacuum type of thing, can still be either first order or first order. My question is then whether this can actually. Uh, so this is not, doesn't have to be first order. Really? It can be. Yeah, so basically, if you the monopole radius is like one on g times v, and if you make the monopole radius of a, of a critical size, then the monopoles are just classically unstable and they will spontaneously change. That was actually the case study here. Okay, but it doesn't go through the tunneling process? No. Oh, okay. Basically, does it break no. away? Like, like yeah. you have uh, well, all it, the like, it's sort of a like I mean if it was a fixed potential either the monopoles are exist or they don't but if you, you could think of some temperature dependence where for example the you, you uh, the true vacuum changes and then um, you can have the case where the monopoles at some, at some critical temperature just fine. So I guess this would be related to then like calculating the probability of creation of those monopoles, right? Like whatever way you are creating them. Because like let's say they are unstable. So if mm -hmm. you are there, then it's just gonna expand and convert the vacuum. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like here you are assuming there is there is a monopole to begin with, and then what is the effect of that? Mm -hmm. yes. If I really want to quantify it, I should say how do I get them? Yeah. And then what is the effect of that? I don't mean, know. I don't know if you thought about because there's an additional yeah. probability. I thought that my understanding was that your bound section for the impurity was the probability to uh, create a monopole with a critical size. No, Just no, like no. It, it's starting with the monopole, starting with the monopole and, the and then it, it turns to a monopole of a larger size where it's critical and then it works. So you're starting, you're, you're starting with a, you, you start here with a, a monopole at this, this sort of uh, small size, which is a metastable, and then you tunnel to a large monopole. And that large monopole will expand. Sorry, I lost that. Maybe the last question, yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is so summarized because why monopole that one? Do you know who Elon Musk is? So I can't take credit for this. This is where this is critiques, critiques idea. But, um, no, I guess the like, joke's yeah, not yeah. that funny if I have to explain it. So I'm not <laughs> sure if I should get yeah, Sorry, it. I should get it. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can explain it. <laughs> you, you don't want to be recorded. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Play for tea. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, let's thank Michael for the excellent talk. Let's end the session today and let's see you all tomorrow. Sure. Can I ask something very simple about this? Sure. Um, so you have two computers that trace time.